The Marvel Cinematic Universe is filled with intricate stories, characters with intertwining paths, and a massive retcon problem. With a huge franchise that spans over 20 movies and 11 years, it would have been impossible not to leave a few things behind. The thing is, we can't help but wonder what happened with a few key scenes and plot devices Marvel's left scattered throughout its universe. Without further ado, let's take a look at some of the things Marvel decided to sweep under the rug. Let's start things off with one of the most ominous of all the Marvel post credit scenes. At the end of Thor The Dark World, Thor's posse strolls into nowhere and meets the Collector. The scene itself is quite strange, and sets a super dark tone for what might happen next. Spoiler alert incoming, nothing happens. The Collector looks at his assistant with the ether in hand, brooding over its raw power as the Asgardians leave and whispers, one down, five to go. Cut to black, roll credits. We see the Collector again in Guardians of the Galaxy and Infinity War, but we don't even see another mention of his plan. What gives, Marvel? One theory to this might be that the actor was busy elsewhere. In 2017, Benicio Del Toro was busy with The Last Jedi and other projects. It's not likely, though. Maybe having two baddies gunning for the stones was too much for MCU fans to handle. But that doesn't explain why Marvel decided to elaborate on this post credit scene in the Guardians of the Galaxy prequel, Infinite Comic. The comic was meant to bridge the Dark World and Guardians of the Galaxy, but after that, we don't hear about this diabolical plan ever again. We guess we'll just let Marvel sweep this one under the rug for now. The Mandarin One of the greatest threats to Iron Man the MCU's ever seen. With ten alien rings of power on his hands, Iron Man struggled to keep this supervillain under control in Iron Man 3. Wait, that doesn't sound right. That's because it isn't. The Mandarin we see in Iron Man 3 is a homeless man and also a crazed pharma bro. Except neither of them are actually the Mandarin. In the movie itself, this villain is the Mandarin by name only. If you went out and bought yourself a copy of Thor The Dark World on DVD or Blu-ray, you were treated to a one-shot titled All Hail the King. In this short film, Marvel gave us a great glimpse at who the Mandarin really is and what might come next. Trevor Slattery is held at gunpoint while agents of the real Mandarin bust him out of prison. But that's the last we ever see of these characters. Even though Iron Man is one of the most beloved MCU characters, Iron Man 3 wasn't exactly a huge hit with fans. It seems like Marvel just moved past the whole thing, and with the recent events of the MCU, we probably won't ever know what happens. Speaking of retconned material, what was up with the fake Infinity Gauntlet in Odin's vault? In the first Thor movie, if you look close enough, you can see the Infinity Gauntlet in the vault as the Destroyer obliterates the Frost Giants. Marvel knows that fans love to pick this stuff apart, but why even include it if we already know Thanos is a part of the story? We saw Thanos at the end of the first Avengers, albeit without his famous gauntlet. It wouldn't be until Thor Ragnarok that Hela proves this artifact to be a complete fake. It also seems odd that Marvel would retcon something in Ragnarok that we already knew was fake, seeing as how the gauntlet in the vault already has all six Infinity Stones in it. Obviously, Marvel was trying to give fans a glimpse of what was yet to come, but it couldn't have been done in a worse way. The weirdest part of all of it is that Thanos forced the dwarf Idri to create the gauntlet for him, but how could Odin have known what it would look like if it wasn't already made? After all, he is all-seeing, but maybe give a heads up to the dwarves of Nidavellir who make your weapons. The Soul Stone, as stories go, holds a certain wisdom. It's undeniably seen firsthand when Thanos wins it by sacrificing Gamora to Red Skull on Vormir. It seems like the stone has stayed here since the beginning of time, but that may not be 100% true. There's a theory out there that Heimdall possessed the stone before Thanos tracked it down. Heimdall's eyes share the same color as the stone, and there's been a gem of some kind in his armor. As the gatekeeper to the Bifrost, he took his job seriously and seemed to tap into some kind of residual energy the Bifrost gave off. Was it his nature and deep skill that made him so knowing? Was it proximity to the Bifrost, or was it the Soul Stone that helped him connect to another soul? We're not sure if this is true and part of the story, a choice the MCU went a different direction with, or a bunch of baloney. Either way, it's compelling. We know Heimdall certainly has some kind of power on his side, and the careful color matching of his eyes and the stone is too good to pass up. Early in the MCU came the Incredible Hulk. He's one of the first few heroes we meet in the franchise, and it even had a promising end credit scene. General Thunderbolt Ross is in a bar drinking a green cocktail when Tony Stark comes in for some banter and a proposition. He cockily says, what if I told you we were putting a team together? Ross returns with a rhetorical, who's we? Ross feels defeated, and maybe he is, but his defeat made the general public get one step closer to accepting help from heroes. 
Tony would eventually help form the Avengers, but General Ross was nowhere to be found in that process. He returns in Captain America Civil War, still not wanting to trust heroes with the public's safety. Ross is part of a group invested in maintaining control over those that are now part of a well-known Avengers team, the very team that was pitched to him in The Incredible Hulk. We don't really know a ton about what happened to Ross in between the two movies, but it definitely wasn't a ton of reflection. His choices led to an almost fatal fracture in the Avengers team. Thanks, General Ross. When Thor is brought to the Water of Sight in Avengers Age of Ultron, knowing that the visions aren't typically good, he knows what he has to do. He's immediately called on by Heimdall to wake up. Images flash before him, as Guardians fighting and fleeing, Ultron, the Scepter, the Earth, and then the four Infinity Stones that have been found so far. He hears Extinction, and when the stones are seen, they're in a gold gauntlet much like the one Thanos wears. Age of Ultron came out in 2015, Thor Ragnarok came out in 2017, and Avengers Infinity War in 2018. While this vision was important to help Thor battle Ultron and foreshadow Ragnarok, it also foreshadowed Avengers Infinity War and Endgame. Heimdall is mostly all-knowing, or at least all-feeling, and knows the future isn't bright. He tries to help Thor see through his eyes, and like earlier, those eyes are much like the Soul Stone. In Thor's vision, his eyes are white, like lightning indicating that the two are connected. They can, when needed, reach into each other's worlds through sight and help each other. Thor can't know or see exactly what'll happen, but we assume it was much, much darker than how Ragnarok actually ended up. Let's jet back into Iron Man 3 and talk about what actually happened. The movie starts with Tony battling with severe PTSD and struggling with his superhero identity. It's, uh, it's literally the entire plot of the movie. In order for Tony to keep being Iron Man, he needs to understand what it means to be Iron Man. He goes completely off the deep end and started developing hundreds upon hundreds of alternate Iron Man suits as a way to protect humanity, but eventually blows them all up in order to reconcile with his identity. This certainly does help him reconcile his identity as Iron Man, but just a few short years later, he's back at it again with the suits. This time in Age of Ultron, his PTSD has been mostly cured, and his Iron Man suits are back up and running. Almost like it never happened. Without these suits, though, we wouldn't have some of the most iconic scenes in the franchise. But we can't help but feel like the Marvel writers could have at least let us know how he got them back. The Age of Miracles sounds like something good, right? How about when a Hydra defector says it while gazing creepily at Scarlet Witch and her twin brother? Miraculous to the right people, we suppose. Anyway, in the post credit scene for the Winter Soldier, Baron Strucker seems to have found a way to alter humans. We see Scarlet Witch and Quicksilver in the early stages of their powers. Quicksilver doesn't look to have tons of control, but Scarlet Witch does. They were made as weapons, much like Bucky for Hydra to control and destroy with. Strucker talks about a new race, but the idea isn't followed through in the MCU. Are they mutants or inhumans? How are they the only ones? Quicksilver dies as fast as he's introduced in the Age of Ultron movie, but Scarlet Witch survives and becomes the powerhouse Avenger we know and love. If more humans had been experimented on, would they have bred mutants? Strucker sure hoped so, but it never panned out in the MCU. It could still stand as a setup for later, though. Released in 2014, The Winter Soldier is a kingpin movie in the MCU, featuring Captain America's homecoming with his friend and the Avengers get to grow a little more. Something else happens in The Winter Soldier that you might not expect. A quick reference to Stephen Strange. That's right, the same Stephen Strange from the Doctor Strange movie that came out two years later in 2016. Named in a list along with other big players like Bruce Banner and the Secretary of Defense is Doctor Strange back when he was still a popular but rude master surgeon. So why is he mentioned? How does Hydra know what he'll become? Later in the scene, they talk about the digital age, time, and most importantly, the future. When Captain America asks how Hydra could know who will eventually be a threat, Agent Sidwell answers, how could it not? Given that Doctor Strange and his decisions eventually lead the Avengers to their 1 in 14,605 shot at saving the Earth, he does become important. In their defense, even if they didn't yet know who he could be, he's still a threateningly good doctor. Doctor Strange could bring people back from the dead, save their lives, and had a mind to rival Tony Stark. Cocky, but brilliant, just caring enough, but self-absorbed and wealthy. Those seem like dangerous traits to have in a war against your citizens. How much do you remember about the second movie in the MCU franchise? Do you remember a middling performance by Edward Norton? What about the played-up love interest between Bruce Banner and Betty Ross? Nothing? Good. Marvel wants to keep it that way. 
Almost the entirety of the Incredible Hulk would end up getting retconned, although that's probably a good thing. Betty Ross is the daughter of Thunderbolt Ross, and the movie set Bruce and Betty up in a storm between herself, the Hulk, Bruce, and General Ross. After The Incredible Hulk, the only time Bruce ever gets romantically close to anyone is in Age of Ultron, but just like his first relationship, it gets thrown out the window. Although Black Widow's relationship was more interesting and served as a plot point, Betty Ross was just a blip in a long line of characters that didn't make the cut. Marvel's decision to retcon the relationship wasn't for the better, though, since the Hulk really wasn't that fleshed out as a character until much later. Maybe bringing Betty back into the MCU wouldn't have been the worst thing ever. Everyone who follows the MCU knows Hydra, the group formed for world domination on the basis that humanity couldn't be free. We see their beginnings in Captain America the First Avenger in World War II time, with heavy German accents and underground bunkers. Hydra infiltrated S.H.I.E.L.D., which is poked fun at during the most recent Avengers Endgame movie when Cap says, Hail Hydra. Hydra is an underlying thread throughout many of the Marvel movies, especially for Captain America and his childhood friend Bucky. In an unexpected turn of events, Hydra is still added during modern times in Ant-Man. When Hank Pym is on the run trying to research, build, and find his wife, Hydra is one of the buyers of some rogue Pym particles. It's curious what value Hydra saw in the Pym particles because no one knew what they could be used for until several years later. Did Hydra have a plan? Did they know Pym's relationship with Ant-Man and the Wasp? What kind of havoc would Hydra have caused with these particles? Unfortunately, this is another theory we don't know the answer to. The whole thing got swept under the rug pretty quickly and was definitely not at the center of either Ant-Man movie. Maybe Hydra's interested in time travel too, given what they knew about the future in Doctor Strange. Let's put Iron Man back in the spotlight, or shadows for this matter. The Extremis program created by Maya Hansen and Aldrich Killian would have been a complete game changer for everyone living in the MCU. With the ability to grow limbs back completely, Bucky could have his arm back, and with any luck, Nebula would have uh, most of her body grown back. Many more characters in the MCU TV world could have also benefited from this tech, if Marvel ever did anything with it. The Extremis program was basically just an elaborate way to provide Iron Man with a villain in Iron Man 3. It was used briefly in the MCU in some TV shows, but beyond that, nothing but radio silence from Marvel. Come on! With all the super soldier serum running amok in the MCU, you'd think Marvel would be able to fit this one in. They even gave it a cool name after Iron Man 3, The Centipede Project. Marvel hyped fans up by teasing Extremis and Centipede and Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D., and finished it with Iron Man 3, but ultimately never pursued it any further after that. We guess humanity didn't learn from Captain America or the Hulk, but with all that setup and potential, we're sad to see it fizzle out like it did. You know how we mentioned that the entirety of the 2008 Incredible Hulk movie was retconned? Yeah, we really weren't kidding. Not only was Bruce's love interest smashed out of existence, metaphorically of course, but so was the setup for the next big bad in the MCU. When Samuel Stearns is forced to create the abomination, he gets knocked onto the floor with a gaping wound on his forehead. Cue the ominous music and zoom in on Sam as his forehead bubbles and he grins directly at the camera. And that would be the last time we ever see the leader. Sam Stearns plays a big role in The Incredible Hulk, and the leader is one of his arch enemies in the comics, so why don't we see more of him? Well, probably because the Hulk didn't really play a huge role in the MCU until much later. The head of Marvel Studios, Kevin Feige, has said that they want to bring these characters back, but are just waiting for the right time. He even mentioned that the Abomination is being held in a prison somewhere. But we're not holding our breath for the return of the leader. The performance and lead up to the leader is an absolute cringe fest, and if you don't remember that either, there's your reason. If Marvel does ever bring the leader back, they're probably going to retcon his role in the original movie as well. The Nova Corps are probably only known by fans of the comics, or people that really like John C. Riley. They were in the first Guardians of the Galaxy movie after Peter Quill, aka Star-Lord, is taken captivity with an Infinity Stone, and Gamora is hunting him down. The Guardians of the Galaxy are mostly formed when we see the Nova Corps in action. They're that military force that forms that really cool golden force field around Xandar. Anyways, while Quill and Rocket are flying around trying to take down Thanos' crew, the Nova Corps' general, Denarian Saul, comes to help. They seem like a very productive force for Xandar, even if John C. Riley is a part of it. They're serious but silly, and err on the side of doing whatever it takes to protect Xandar. It gives some serious Star Wars vibes when their leader, Hirani Rail, is watching them from the ground and coordinating the efforts. 
So if they're so cool, why is this the only time we see them? Well, yeah, Thanos does destroy Xandar, but we're sure the Nova Corps didn't go out without a heck of a fight. Hopefully, Roman Day gave his powers to someone else before he died so he could finally get Nova in the MCU. After seeing Thor destroy access to the Bifrost Bridge in the first Thor movie, questions about traveling to and from Asgard are rightfully raised. Thor does this to stop Loki, but needs to get back to Earth numerous times to continue to save it. In between movies, the Bifrost is obviously used again, so how did it break and how is it fixed? What purpose does the bridge even serve? What's often forgotten about the Bifrost Bridge is that it's dimensional energy. The Rainbow Bridge was used to harness the Bifrost Bridge for Asgardians, so when the Rainbow Bridge was broken, the Bifrost wasn't. The Bifrost can be accessed as needed through dark magic. Using dark magic is no easy feat, and we see very few characters in the MCU use it on screen. Most notably, Odin uses dark magic to access the Bifrost, and the Ancient One uses it all the time to protect time, life, and goodness. So, Thor breaks the Rainbow Bridge, so Loki can't use the Bifrost to destroy planets or flee. Typical Loki stuff. Yet Odin is able to help his other son use the Bifrost anyway, and eventually Asgard rebuilds their bridge. So, what was the point of the bridge in the first place, then? Well, with all these cut storylines, us Marvel fans are left in the dark, wondering what could have been. What story do you think is the most likely to come back? Let us know in the comments below, and make sure to subscribe to CBR to stay up on all the best Marvel content. Hey, thanks for watching.